Session number three, million dollar message, otherwise known as the value proposition. So in this class, we're going to talk about owners first. How do we converse with those owners? What problems can we solve for them? And I'm going to list a few. How to get the owner to talk to you. Um, and we're going to use some uh, uh, copywriting terminology uh, when we get to that point to capture their attention. Uh, what to say to the owner. More importantly, what questions to ask the owner. Uh, then we will talk about syndicators because we may not like the information we get from the owner, but the owner may be entertaining selling the property. That doesn't mean we hang up and go to the next person. Let's ask some questions, figure out where they were or where they are. And can we maybe sucker is the best word, a syndicator into buying or overpaying for this asset? That's on them. We know they're still doing it. Uh, so we need to build relationships with the syndicators as well. Uh, I call it becoming a strategic partner and working with the syndicators as a strategic partner. So we'll define what a strategic partner is, what the different roles are, not just acquisitions, but there are other roles. How to identify what role you want and then getting paid as a strategic partner and what to do with that acquisition fee once you get paid. A lot of you have probably seen this part of the presentation or you haven't seen what to do with owners. You've probably seen this part, but there are a lot of people on here that have never seen me teach before, and this will definitely benefit them. And then we'll talk about action steps to move you forward and go into our second to last Q&A session of the day. So where are we? So far, we uh, have talked about goals and numbers, and we have talked about market selection. So we are now creating our million dollar message. When we finish this session, the foundation will be complete. Where most people take years to complete this, just these three steps, these foundational elements, you, you guys are going to have it done in eight hours. Okay. So what problems can we solve for the owner? That's a question I get all the time. Know that when we're reaching out to folks, whether we're reaching out to them through email, phone calls, texts, direct message, whatever the case is, whatever that contact attempt is, if you're just attempting to contact and say, hey, I'm an investor, are you a seller? They're going to hang up on you. They're not going to respond to you. They're going to ignore you. They're going to block you. It's got to be about them. The problem with most people is they make it about themselves. It must be about them. So how do we identify what we can do for them? Well, first we have to list what three problems can we solve for owners? Anybody want to give any guesses before I list a few? Tenant headaches or property management headaches. Okay. I like it. Uh, they Definitely need to, gains taxes. Okay, taxes. They, they need to inject capital because they can't afford to put money into the property to keep it up. Okay, tenant issues, capital expenses. What about some of the stuff we've been over already today? <laughs> yeah, well, loan problems. Pantry financing. Right? What about market timing? Do you guys not have now? The skills, well, maybe not the skill yet because you have to build a skill, but do you not now have the education and the tools to be able to determine where you are in the market? And would you be uh, shocked to know that 90% of the owners out there have absolutely no idea where they are in the market? Would that not be valuable information for an owner? They're probably witnessing rent declines. They may or may not be. There are, look, we're, we're looking at an entire MSA when we did that analysis, and there are trade areas and submarkets inside MSA. Some will do better than others. Some properties will operate better than others. But if you, the owner, which may be doing okay now, may not be experiencing a rent decline yet. So if you had that conversation with them, 
then it may open their eyes to that. They might have a loan coming due. We see this a lot right now. If it's bridge and they are willing to negotiate for a solution that can actually solve the problem, then this could be something that uh, can be talked about. But this is a problem that they are currently experiencing our loan maturities coming due in a rising interest rate environment. Visible deferred maintenance. You drive by a property, it's got visible deferred maintenance. They have issues, probably management issues. Maybe they're um, maybe they're managing it themselves or they could be an out-of-state owner and haven't been by the property ever. You don't know. Uh, you'd be surprised how many syndicators out there don't visit their properties, which makes no sense to me, but we see it all the time. And then, of course, that was mentioned, bad management. Okay, so these are some problems that we can start to identify. Yeah, Sean, deferred maintenance definitely equals motivation, especially in a declining rent situation. Okay, so these are problems that we can identify, but, you know, what happens if they don't solve the problem. It's not enough to just identify what the problems are. Take it a step further. This, this now starts to come into a little copywriting, a little salesmanship where when you're having a conversation with the owner, have you guys ever heard the term? Um, let, me, let me see if I can remember what it's called. I've always hated this. Um, but uh, um, problem, agitate, solve. Have you ever heard that in sales? Gamer says, yep. Okay, what's, what's that mean? You identify or you bring up a problem that the owner may be experiencing or that the person you're trying to sell something to may be experiencing. Okay. So they've identified they have a problem. The next step, and again, I don't subscribe to this model, but it is kind of what we're doing here, is you agitate that problem. It, it, we equate it to um, taking a knife and stabbing it into somebody. They have a problem. They now have a hole in their stomach. And then you twist that knife. Now they got a big problem because they got a big hole in their stomach. But then you have a solution. You can stop their bleeding and bandage them up. That's problem, agitate, solve. Okay. So at this part of it, this is the agitation portion. So through questions that we ask or where you are have identified where this problem, this property might have a problem, either through the research you did on the owner or the property, now we can start to uh, ask the owner because we already know the answer to the question, because we're going to identify it right here, is what happens if they don't solve that problem? So. NOI drops below debt service because they have falling rents. The market, the rents are falling. The owner may or may not know that's creeping up on them, okay? So you can let them know, look, market is changing. We're seeing the NOIs drop uh, all across the market. Are you prepared for that if it happens to your property? And you know, if so, what does that mean to you? Get them to answer that question. Loan comes due without the ability to sell or refi. We're going to see a lot of this if the interest rates continue to do what they do. Occupancy declines because of property condition. Goes back to that deferred maintenance. People start moving out. They don't like that curb appeal anymore. Their leases come due. Psh, they're gone. Lender calls loan due early because their NOI drops below that debt service coverage ratio. Rut row raggy. Now we got big problems. Okay, so these are if... The owner doesn't solve the problems you've identified in the market. These are things that can happen based on those problems. Does this make sense? The reason we're going over this is because this allows you to identify what kind of conversation you can have with an owner to get them to listen to you. So once we've identified what happens if they don't solve it? Now we need to be able to solve it. We can't just stick the knife in and twist it and walk away. 
We have to have that Band-Aid, that bandage. We got to be able to stop the bleeding and put the bandage on it. So what can we do if the loan, if the owner says, you know, yeah, you know, our rents are declining and my NOI is going down, but what the heck am I supposed to do? Okay, so you've got some solutions in your toolbox that you can offer the owner and it doesn't always have to be, well, I'll buy the property from you. Doesn't have to always be that. It could be something else where you gain their like and trust first. And then you say, look, you know, uh, here's that solution. Uh, here's what we've identified. And, you know, if you're just absolutely tired of this, and this is a later conversation after you've solved the problem, then start having that conversation. Or if they just say, look, and I'm just tired of this place, let's sell it. Obviously, you're going to have that conversation at that point. But we're trying to get them to like and trust us because people do not do business with people they do not know, like, and trust. So you can do a loan audit. If you understand how to get a loan and you understand the loan documents, maybe the owner doesn't even know that the debt service coverage ratio clause is in their contract. They may not know that. And when you ask that question, hey, is your NOI still above your debt service coverage ratio? And they're like, what the hell are you talking about? I don't know what that means. What's debt service coverage ratio? That's an owner that's unsophisticated, which you know spells opportunity for us. But we can offer instead of just saying, oh, man, you don't need to own a property. Let, let, let us buy it from you. You could just say, hey, tell you what, if you don't mind, we're willing to take a look at your documents. We can do a loan audit for you and see if you are truly in trouble or not, or um, at what point you may become in trouble. Okay, so you can use that tool in your toolbox. Do a property management audit. If you know how to operate a property or you have a property manager friend that knows how to operate a property and they do have deferred maintenance and their rents are declining and the occupancy is declining, offer to do a property management audit. Provide a demand supply analysis. So if they argue with you and say, my rents are declining, you're full of crap, offer them to do a demand supply analysis and show them the numbers and let them know, look, you know, you're doing great. That's awesome. But look what the market's doing. Are you prepared if this affects you? Do an income expense audit if their NOI is dropping. And then, you know, if it comes up, offer to purchase the property. Now, maybe you don't purchase it. Maybe you build a relationship with a syndicator that purchases it, but let them know that, you know, you are interested in possibly purchasing this asset if it gets to that point. Uh, the lenders are constantly doing audits. They visit properties um, and they ask for uh, updated financials on a consistent basis. So they know whether your NOI is dropping below or not. Good question. Oh, you guys didn't see that. So somebody asked, uh, how does the lender know DSCR is not at uh, this said standard, but I think it means minimum. That's how they know. So once you've done all of that, now you basically have your million dollar message or your value proposition for owners. I help multifamily owners, whatever, whatever that solution is, so they can, and that's either have more cash flow, uh, be able to sell without the pain and heartache. You have to figure this out through what problems you've identified and what solutions you can solve, then you can fill this out and this becomes your elevator pitch, if you will, your value proposition, your million dollar message. Okay, so let's take a look at the worksheet, which will make much more sense than what I just explained. And pull that up. Is there a question? Would you, mind, would you mind going back to that? $10 million slide. I just want to screenshot it. Uh, you don't need to because it's at the bottom of the worksheet. Uh, we're gonna... uh, here, just screenshot that one. All right. Cool. Good. All right. Thank you. All right. So 
this step, we need to get specific and narrow down the owner's problems they're facing and the solutions we can offer them. This will act as the core of your marketing message and drive the creation of your marketing campaign and your entire business model. So just like we said in the PowerPoint, what are the three or what is the owner's three potential biggest problems in the market? Okay. And so now we can see what those are. Go back to that market identification worksheet where you can see some failures and some cracks that are happening in the market that they may not uh, know are even happening. What can happen if they don't solve this problem? We talked about that. Uh, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but what is a hook you can use to capture the owner's attention? And we're going to cover that one in just a minute. So a hook is uh, a copywriting term for stopping somebody in their tracks. Or when you get somebody on a phone, you have exactly about three to five seconds to keep them on the phone before they hang up on you. These are known as hooks. Okay, we'll talk about those in a minute. What solutions can you offer the owner? Why should the owner allow you to bring an offer and not use a broker? So once you've answered these other four questions, answer this because that question may not come up. Woo. And I hope I don't lose my internet because we are having a major lightning storm outside. I don't know if you guys can hear that thunder or not. Um, so if you can answer this, it just prepares you for that objection handle when they uh, ask it, all right? And then you just create your million dollar message. So this is the worksheet. So there's not a whole lot to creating your million dollar message for the owner. It's pretty self-explanatory. Well, it's not self-explanatory. It's pretty basic, but you'll be separating yourself from everybody else that's just getting on the phone, dialing for dollars and saying, I'm an investor in your market. Uh, are you looking to sell? Click. Because they hear it a million times a day. Instead, if you talk about them and you have a solution for them based on the problems that are in the marketplace or for their property because you're familiar with their property or you're familiar with their situation, then you'll get much more traction with them than if you don't do this. Does that make sense? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. David, I'm sorry. Can you scroll back through that sheet again? I feel like I missed something. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Okay, pull it back up. We'll be covering this in a second. What's the hook? What solutions? And why should the owner... Uh, allow you to bring an offer and not use a broker. And no, obviously, I feel like I broke broker. Something. I'm talking with David. <laughs> Funny guy. It's just it's just so information dense. I mean, you have a lot of good information. Ooh, there went the power. Did I lose you guys? No. Nope. All right, no, still now here. Back up. So we got at least an hour. No, it, it flickered and came back on again. I now if if this side of my face goes dark, you know the power's out because that lamp is on uh, is not on the battery backup. This lamp over here is or these soft lights. So I got one soft light that's on the battery backup and another one that's not. So you know I've lost power for sure when this side of my face, the left side of my face, goes dark. Can we check on <laughs> the recording? Make sure it's still recording. It's recording. Yep, we're good. So, David, a question. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, the number five, have you talked to us about how to respond to that yet? No, this is just for you. So, if an owner asks you, why should I allow you to bring an offer and not use a broker? Run through some examples that you uh, believe would work. You can say, um, how much is a broker going to cost you to sell a property? Always try to answer a question with a question. So that way you can dig a little deeper and understand why they're asking that question. That allows you to answer it better. That's objection handling 101. Okay. Uh, other things are um, you have relationships in the marketplace and partners 
uh, that have um, purchased however many properties in the last two or three years, and you can save the owner a lot of pain and heartache of having to deal with a broker and having multiple people across the property, um, and that uh, you know you can guarantee you'll get them market price. Now, they may not know what market price is. We haven't asked them at this point what they're offering. We're just continuing the conversation with them. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> so how do we get the owner to talk to us? You need a hook. Okay. So what's a hook? A hook captures anybody's attention. When you're scrolling Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, doesn't matter. Something captures your attention and you stop scrolling. Usually it's an ad, um, but something stops you. That's what a hook is. A hook captures your attention, but we have a very, very, very short period of time to be able to capture their attention. The biggest thing is that we have to make it about them and not us. All right. That's where most people fail. Again, they reach out, they email, they text, they direct message, and it's always the same thing. Hey, I want to put an offer in on your property. Hey, I'm an investor. I've bought this many units. Are you willing to sell to us? It's, it's always about them, never about the owner. So you want to make it about the owner. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here, keeping in mind that I just recently taught uh, over the last three weeks, a master lease option class. And uh, these were the hooks that I came up with for that master lease option. It does apply to this. Um, and we can use this to our advantage because we can go a couple of different directions with it. So stay with me for a minute as you look at this, because you're going to look at this and you're going to be like, there's no way um, I can do that. Stay with me for a minute. Okay. This is the proper use of a hook. So uh, written material, email, text, direct message. I, I wouldn't use a, a Facebook post or LinkedIn post or something like that, but some kind of written message direct to the owner. If you're worried about the coming recession and whether your NOI is going to drop below your loan amount, we can make sure you always have your debt service coverage covered. Would that not stop you in your tracks? Yes, it would. That's a hook. Something that will stop you. Wait a minute. How in the world can you make sure my debt service is coverage, covered? It at least sparks up a conversation. They're going to either think you're just freaking crazy, you're lying to them, but they might ask because you never know. What do you mean? Okay, and we'll get to that. So you've got them on the phone, you're cold calling, and they answer. Oh my God, they answered the phone. So John says, hello. Oh, hey, John, I'm David Monroe with Premier Apartment Services. I'm calling to see if you'd like your debt payments at 123 Main Street guaranteed for the next three years. What's John going to do? If you heard that on the phone, what would you do? Ask how. Oh, you mean you didn't hang up? Nope. <laughs> huh. What about anybody else? How would you respond? I'm not telling you you're not going to get hangups. Of course you're going to get hangups. Tell People me more. Like yeah, right? It's a hook. I've captured their attention. And I've got it for the moment, but I'm not going to have it very long. So how do we respond to that? Who, how, can anybody answer how you would respond to this? I will be very impressed. Maybe begin with their pain questions. Oh, okay. I love questions. Well, right um, possibly you can't guarantee. It's not possible. No, you, you could do it. You could do it as a subject too. No, we don't do subject to, Sean. It's illegal. What's the catch? What's the catch, right? But how do you respond to that when they say what's the catch? Well, I'm thinking that their issue, if they're worried about their debt coverage ratio, is their income. And I'm wondering about going down the path of renting some of their vacant spaces, a master lease. Ha! Oh, look at you, Steve. You're amazing. So we don't know yet. We don't have enough information. So you can respond by saying, look, I have two solutions I can help you with. But before I talk about those, is there a problem with your loan or your net income that's got you worried that you won't be able to make your payments? Something must be going on because you asked the question. 
Now we've got their attention. Now we're going to be able to start to drill down and actually figure out where the problem is located. And we can start to use those problems and solutions and drill down to get to that point. So the two solutions we happen to have in our toolbox right now, one of those is like Steve just said, you may be able to identify that there might be a master lease opportunity here. Absolute bonus if you can do that, because now you don't need anybody else. You just take over this uh, asset yourself and uh, you would need an operating partner to come with you like a property management company because you definitely don't want to manage this yourself. But that's what my master lease option class does is explain how to negotiate that part of it. The other is how about offering a loan uh, audit? So if uh, they are worried about that DSCR falling, maybe you can combine with a uh, loan document audit and a a, uh, a PL audit or a T12 audit if they happen to get T12s. Most of these owners that we're talking to probably won't be at that point, but they'll have uh, PLs. So maybe you offer to do a PL along with um, a loan document audit. And now you can start to identify and come up with solutions for the owner. Is, is this making sense? Yes. For them, not for us. Now, will it help us later? Yes. Because if we do identify that the owner is interested in selling, who's the first person they're going to want to sell to? Me. Well, you. The person that helped them. What's that called? When, when you do something for somebody and they want to return the favor, what's that called? Reciprocity. Reciprocity. Law of reciprocity. reciprocity. You guys got it. Okay. Oh, is, is a master lease similar to just a lease option? Um, no, they're two different things, but they are uh, together. So they're two different agreements. The master lease leases the property. The lease option gives you the option to purchase the property after a period of time. They are two completely separate documents and should be two separate documents. I do know some people will teach. It should be one document, but absolutely not. It should be two documents, but it is used in one strategy. Good Thank question. You. All right, so we can get to them through email, through text, through LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter posts, although I would not recommend doing that, but it is a way you can be posting about the different problems that are in the marketplace and how uh, what happens if they don't solve those problems and the solutions to those problems. You can post about stuff like that. Just don't use too many specifics or you'll have people stealing stuff from you. And then there'll be competition that you didn't think you had because you're letting it all out there into the marketplace. All right. Direct message is better. LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, wherever you can get direct message with them because you've connected with them on uh, social media. So can you guys all mute, please, that if you're not asking questions so we don't get the feedback? Voicemail. So if you try to phone them and they don't answer and expect, ooh, that was interesting. Do I still have you? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that was weird because that light's still on. So the power didn't go out, but it feels like half the power went out. All right. Anyway, it doesn't matter. My battery backup didn't come on, so I'm still okay. So voicemail is another great way to leave that hook with the owner. And we'll talk about that when we get into the marketing plan. And then of course, a written letter and a postcard for that written message. Okay. And if they answer the phone, they do every once in a while, they will answer the phone. Um, I get shocked when an owner answers the phone anymore. Uh, but every once in a while, you'll get somebody that will answer the phone. You got to be ready. So have that script ready to go. Okay. So now the owner's talking to you. What the heck are you going to say to him? So the owner doesn't hang up. We're calling them, boom, boom, boom. They answer or they call you because they're responding to an email or to a text or something like that. We're, now we have to be able to ask good questions, okay? So we've got to pull out their problems, their pains, and their issues. We do that through asking questions. So why do you feel your NOI will drop below the loan payment, okay? Back to that first hook that we got them to respond to us. 
what is the biggest problem you have with the property? Is the property affecting your personal life? If so, how? Ooh. Would you guys ask this question? I would. I do. But now. Yeah. Speaks to motivation. Yeah. I think it's a great question because it might be causing problems in their marriage. That's correct. It might be taking up too much of their personal time and they want to do other things. That's correct. Yeah. It might be eating away at their capital stack or their personal wealth. That's right. If they've already crossed that line with their debt coverage ratio. That's correct. Exactly. So what we're doing is we're seeing where they are emotionally. It allows us to come up with a solution based on what their answers are. That's the whole reason we ask these questions. What are the financial risks or concerns or what financial risks or concerns do you have for the future? How do you plan to address them? Another one of those, ooh, I've never asked that kind of question, question, but the amount of information you can get from that, if they'll answer you, is invaluable. Go ahead, Jason. Vivian, um, are we going to have a copy of the slide so that I don't have to write all this down? <laughs> yes, Jason, you will have a copy of the slides. You're not going to get the PowerPoint themselves, but it'll be in PDF. Okay, thank you. You guys know I give the copies to all this stuff. Kim, did you have a mess uh, question? I saw you unmuted. No, I'm I'm good. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and one more thing, David. What is a loan audit and what's a property audit and how do I actually do those things? Um, well, you have to first understand the clauses that are in a loan document in order to be able to do that. Uh, and you can build relationships with lenders to help you understand that. Okay. Uh, and then a financial audit's no more than looking over their financials as if you were going to underwrite it. And, uh, and identifying where the opportunities are as if you were buying the property. That allows you to find the inefficiencies within the uh, financials. It's no different than looking at the rental analytics for a market and identifying what the story is. The numbers tell us a story. So, so, uh, so I could just, I could just look at the PL or the D12 and like, um, I could. Point out things like, for example, utility expenses increasing every single month, stuff like that, right? Yes. Yep. Them, you know? But don't just point them out, have solutions to solve the problem. Okay. Point out the problem, point out what will happen if they don't solve the problem, and then give them the solution. Okay. Okay. I know it sounds counterintuitive to, but to give them the solution because maybe they don't sell you the property later, but what kind of trust are you building when you do that? What kind of friendship are you building when you do that? No, because, because um, all this stuff makes sense because, because when I was working on the 8 unit deal out in Kansas City, um, um, I basically did this thing that things. Um, um, I was giving him a bunch of solutions to his problems, and then when his dad died, um, I was the first one that he called. Yep, exactly. You just confirmed exactly what I'm putting out here. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. All right. So again, owner still doesn't hang up. Okay. So we're continuing to ask questions here. How is your current management company performing? Okay. Why haven't you replaced them? So if they're not performing, why haven't you replaced them? Why haven't you hired a management company? If you ask that question and they say, I'm, I'm managing the property, what's the problem? Why haven't you hired a management company? 
Uh, let's see. This seems to underscore what you're saying about building a relationship as opposed to that's it. Nail on the head. Love it. Worst answer I ever got to that question was because my brother's managing it. <laughs> and I can't just fire him and I can't throw him out and I can't this and that and I won't kill him. Yep. There there is a um there's a uh an owner that's got a couple of properties and she's been having issues in St. Louis that her brother manages the properties for. Steve, you and I may be talking about the same person. <clears throat> so What's current? Now we got to start drilling down. We're getting a story at this point where we kind of have an idea of where the problems are, where we can find solutions. So now we have to see is there opportunity here. So what is your current NOI? What's the current loan amount? If they'll give it to you and if it makes sense to ask that question yet. And if they are looking to sell, what is their pricing expectation? We need to know this. Yeah, exactly. Never do business with family. That's about right. So if we get to the point where it looks like they're willing to sell this asset, whether it's to us or anybody else, or they're willing to entertain offers, or they just come out and say, look, I know I've got problems. If you've got somebody that would bring me an offer, I, I'd take a look at it. Now we start to, we ask all these questions still because we need to drill down and get the story. Then we start to drill into the financials. What's the current NOI? What's your current loan amount? What is your pricing expectation? Because if we are just going to hand this off to a syndication group, we cannot negotiate. If you are not a real estate broker, you cannot negotiate. But we can get all the documents that we need in order to take it to somebody else. And we can ask them what their expectation is. Then we can take that information and we can pass it on after we get assigned NDA and fee agreement and everything else. Don't give them that information ahead of time because they will circumvent you because that's what people do in this market right now. So can you get a current rent roll in last year's P&L uh, and year to date or T12 if they happen to have a management company or uh, a software if they're doing it themselves that will produce a T12? Okay. Some of them will, some of them won't. Most owners, well, depends. If they're in a syndication student group that you see, most of them know T12s. They may not know how to produce a T12, but they know of T12s. But that's a small percentage of the people in the marketplace that actually own properties. When you run across owners that have had properties for years and years and years and years, they have no idea what a T12 is. Okay, They do know what a profit and loss in a year to date is. Make sense? So now that you have the financials, You've got the price the owner wants, the story about why they want to sell. You need to determine if you want it for yourself or partner with a buyer and get a fee for finding the deal, okay? So that then segues us into finding a strategic partner. So first, we got to identify what is a strategic partner. It is a company or organization that has an arrangement to work with or help another so that it's easier for each one of them to achieve the things they want to achieve. You're looking to take an opportunity you found. You're not wanting to invest in it yourself because it doesn't make sense for you, or maybe it's too big for you, or, um, you know, or, or, or you don't like the market, the timing's wrong for you, whatever the case is, risk, whatever. But you are willing to give it to somebody else. And that other person... It helps them because they need to purchase more assets because they have goals they have to meet, employees they have to pay, so they're still buying assets. Kind of like the question that was asked earlier about even with the timing in the market, we have a business to run. How do we keep purchasing properties? Okay, so that's who we're looking for to hand this off to. So it's a company or organization that has an arrangement to work with or help another so that it's easier for each of you to achieve the things you want to achieve. So here is my million dollar message or value proposition that I had when I was building strategic partnering relationships with syndicators and sponsors. And I was presenting this to people in networking events like uh, 
uh, meetings like this, networking events, education sessions on LinkedIn, on Facebook, any anytime I get a direct message, this was the value proposition or million dollar message I was sending out when I had the opportunity. I'm looking to build strategic partnerships with active established syndicators, sponsors, and key principles where I bring the value of understanding, calculating, and identifying emerging markets, finding off-market opportunities, conducting market and feasibility analysis, expertise in due diligence and underwriting, and assisting in capital raising without taking a piece of the GP, and I'm looking to invest passively in the deals. Okay, That was my million-dollar message. If you are a syndicator out there or a sponsor, that is a hook. Specifically because it says without taking a piece of the GP. That is a hook. Nobody does that. They all want a piece of the GP. I can, I don't want to be part of their team. Trust me. <laughs> Not even remotely close. I have no idea who they are. So what are the different roles a strategic partner can play? Well, first and foremost, there's acquisition or deal flow. That's what we're talking about in this uh, intensive. It is all about getting an acquisition fee because we find an off-market deal. That's why it's called the off-market intensive. But there are other ways to do it. You can get an act part of, be part of the acquisition fee, maybe for a smaller percentage, if you have expertise in underwriting. You have expertise in market and feasibility analysis and demand supply analysis. So demand supply analysis, you all now have the knowledge to do demand supply analysis just from session number two. Okay, taking that to syndicators and letting them know and making them aware about uh, where they are in the market because they probably don't know. They're listening to their brokers. They have no idea that they've had two straight quarters of negative rents in that market. You have the ability to show them that now. Um, and, and David, just real quick, even, yeah. even if we do know, Sometimes we don't have time to go out there and do it. And that's still a valuable asset to bring. There you go. Uh, Andy, we'll talk about the acquisition fee shortly. And he wanted to go back real quick. Right there. Let me know when you're done so I can keep going. All right, good. Sorry about that. All right, so capital raising. So number one in the marketplace right now is off-market opportunities. That doesn't mean from a broker. You are direct to seller. You have an off-market opportunity. That is number one demand for syndicators right now. Number two is capital raising. They are struggling to get their deals uh, capitalized. So if you have the ability to raise capital, that is another way to get paid in a strategic partnership. Now, there are rules involved with that that we're not gonna go over in this class. So if you are doing capital raise, you need to understand the SEC regulations. Don't just go out and raise capital for uh, an acquisition fee because you can get yourself in trouble if you do not do it properly. Project management. If you are a project manager or you're a general contractor um, and you understand project management, that is a huge valuable asset. Boots on the ground. If you're in Indianapolis or you're in Kansas City, contact Jason Malabute. He wants to talk to you. <laughs> He's on this call. Uh, there are people that are looking for boots on the ground in all these markets. Do not invest in a market that you do not live in, that you do not have a boots on the ground relationship in that market, you will get yourself in trouble. Asset manager. Nobody wants to be the asset manager. I got one friend of mine that this is his number one role. This is what he wants to do. Most of you guys know Trevor Thompson, K. Trevor Thompson, very good friend of mine. That man loves operations. He thrives on asset management, okay? That's his role. That's what he identifies as, as a strategic partner is asset manager. Investor relations kind of ties to asset manager. Uh, for any cheat sheets, 
so the best thing I can offer you guys for um, SEC guidelines is buy Gene Trowbridge, Gene Trowbridge, CCIM. Buy his book, It's a Whole New Business, where the number one syndication book I recommend is Best Ever Syndication Book by Joe Fairless. Joe will tell you how to buy properties as a syndicator. Gene Trowbridge will show you how to stay out of jail because it is the most dangerous thing you can do in this marketplace, okay? So, and he provides a cheat sheet um, exactly like you're asking for. Due diligence support. Can you repeat those book names? Gene Trowbridge, it's a whole new business. Joe Fairless, best uh, syndication book ever or best ever syndication book, something like that. Thank you. It's up on my shelf up there, but it's too far away. I can't see it. Great book until I write my own, but I'll probably never do that. Tax saving strategies if you're a CPA, legal services if you're an attorney, insurance brokerage servicers, services if you're an insurance broker, mortgage brokerage services if you're a mortgage broker, and real estate brokerage services if you're a real estate broker. These are all roles you can have as a strategic partner to get an acquisition fee. Okay. Now, what roles did I have in my value proposition? So let's go back to my value proposition. Okay, you could see identifying emerging markets, finding off market opportunities, conducting market and feasibility analysis, due diligence and underwriting, and capital raising. Those were the roles that I identified in my value proposition, okay, in my million dollar message. So, what role are you interested in? Well, Ask yourself, what are you passionate about? Have you guys ever read the book, Good to Great, by Jim Collins? Yep. Yes. In Good to Great, he talks about the hedgehog concept. You guys remember that? Those that have read the book? This is the hedgehog concept. This is how you identify what you, what role you are best suited for, okay? So what are you passionate about? Are you passionate about capital raising? Are you passionate about finding off-market opportunities or marketing or sales? They all correlate to finding off-market opportunities. Are you passionate about visiting properties and, um, and or underwriting deals because you're passionate about math? What are you passionate? What I first identify, what are you passionate about? Then what, are you or can you be the best in the world at? Okay. You don't have to be the best at it now, but can you be the best at it moving forward? If you identify what you're passionate about, do you think you can build those skills and become the best at it? And then is there demand for it? Okay. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get into the middle here so that we can identi identify with all three. We already talked about off-market opportunities being number one in demand, um, capital raising being number two, and boots on the ground being number three. So if you're willing to do any of those, then are you passionate about it? And can you be the best in the world at? So basically, all you have to do at this point is continuously build your education and your skills on your passion and become valuable to the marketplace. Okay. So in my value proposition or my million dollar message, where did I show my value? Well, we know that most syndicators are always looking for emerging markets. The fact that I know how to identify emerging markets and I showed you how to do it today, that's valuable. Off-market opportunities, that's value. If you can bring off-market opportunities, you have really showed your value. Not taking a piece of the GP, huge value. And then investing in the deal, huge value, okay? So I completely took this million-dollar message and created it, and I wrote it on what I knew syndicators were looking for, how I could help them, and the value I could bring to them. You guys see how that worked? It's a little different than dealing with owners when you're dealing 
uh, as being part of a strategic partnership. And trust me, they're much easier to talk to because they need these services, all right? So this was asked earlier, how do we get paid as a strategic partner? Well, you can get a percentage of the GP. Whatever your goals are, it's totally up to you. I personally don't want anything to do with the GP. They don't make any money. None, zip, zilch. After the acquisition fee, you don't get paid a dime until the property sells. That's not what I'm interested in, okay? So I don't want a piece of the GP. Maybe you do. Maybe you want the experience. Maybe they're offering you a couple of other roles where you can gain a bit of experience because you have a goal of building a large multifamily company that owns thousands of units and has hundreds of employees. You definitely are going to want a percentage of the GP so you can learn. Percentage of the acquisition fee. Now I do ascribe to that. And if you're bringing the deal, it's an off-market direct to seller you have communication with that seller, not a broker, not a bird dog, not a wholesaler, direct to seller. You're bringing that to a syndication group. I would ask for half of the acquisition fee. That's just me. That's that's where I value myself. If, they, if they're taking a 4% fee, I want 2%. If they're taking a 3% fee, I want a percent and a half. If they're doing a 2% fee, I want 1%. I don't see any of them doing less than 2%. Okay. That's how I would go about it. Um, so you would even ask for that, David, um, even if you don't know anything about asset management and you're not going to be involved. I'm not staying on board the team. I'm taking my money and running. Mm. I could care less what they do with the property. I already know it doesn't work for me. I don't want to be part of this team. Now, if you're wanting to be part of the team, you got to negotiate it differently. But I'm taking my money and running because what I want to do is I want to take that acquisition fee and I want to go find, uh, well, not me personally, but maybe you want to go find a JV opportunity where you go and buy a 40-unit property with one or two other people as a joint venture partner, and you're going to make 10 times more than that syndication group's going to make on that small property, even if that's a 400-unit deal. No, no, I was talking about the asset management for you to, you to let you want... Half yeah, the half. As, the asset management fee. There's only two entities that get to take part in the asset management fee: the primary sponsor and the asset manager. They are the only ones that get to participate in the asset management really? fee, and it's tiny. Mm. It's, it's, it's negligible. I didn't know that because I thought that 100 percent of the asset management fee goes goes to whoever is doing the asset. Management. Oh no, no. Mm -mm. Oh, oh no. As a matter of fact, um, it's probably going to be seventy percent to the primary sponsor and only thirty percent to the asset manager. Okay. Well, yeah. okay. I didn't need this. Thank you. Yes, sir. Percentage of the asset management fee. Oh, imagine that. Again, it's negligible. Somebody have a question? Yes. Um. It's me. Um, you meant you just mentioned that you would um get get more money if you get the acquisition acquisition fee and join and, and um have a joint venture with a forty units um property. Mm -hmm. But for that, you need experience in a GP. No. You're not, you're not, it's not a syndication. It's a joint venture. There's three of you split in three ways or however much money you're bringing in peri pasu, which means what you put in is what you get out. Look, I did a video. Let me, let me grab the, the link to this video so you can go watch this. Okay. Thank My you. YouTube channel. If I go to videos and I scroll past all my market reports right here, the big lie. Hey, look, there's Sean. This was, uh, this was the last intensive I did. So let me copy that. The I'll big put that in the chat. There you go. Go watch that video. That's eye-opening. Thank you. Okay? Baby. That tells you the truth of what uh, people get paid in a syndication. And Sean and I had a great debate about it. Okay. We did, and I'm I'm happy to uh, to chat about it.
you know, like like I put in the chat, uh, David doesn't want another job being a GP member. And, and if you and if you do it correctly, and that's a big if with a lot of people, it is work. It takes some time and effort to be a general partner. It does. And, and Christine, you're right. There are there are other fees um, that are part of the GP structure, not just the acquisition fee and the asset management fee. You are absolutely correct. So the next is as a strategic partner is a consulting fee. Okay. This is what as a strategic partner, if we are taking the acquisition fee and running and we're not investing in this deal or being part of the GP, we are a marketing consultant. That's how we're presenting ourselves. It is a fancy way of saying you're a bird dog, but we're doing it legally. So how do we do it legally versus the way everybody else is doing it illegally? Because bird dogging is illegal in every state in the country because of the way they do it. They're negotiating between the buyer and the seller and then telling you they want a 3% fee and they're, they're getting the LOI and proof of funds and all that. That's illegal. You are practicing real estate as a real estate broker when you do that. That is illegal in all 50 states. The way to do it legally is what I explained before, where you ask the owner, what is your pricing expectation? Get the documents you need, take that information, underwrite it, make sure you don't want it, and then hand it off to a syndicator where they will go in and negotiate. You do not negotiate. All you're doing is handing it off to somebody else after they agree to a non-disclosure, non-compete with a fee. Get them to sign that first, okay? Now it's turned into a consulting fee. What you do with this to ensure you get paid, because if you trust the sponsor to pay you after closing, you're a fool. Most won't. They're greedy. Trust me. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and the spoon. I've been a fool. What you do is you take the agreement they sign and find out where closing is going to occur, and you send it to the closing attorney or the title agent or wherever your state uses or whatever state that property uses, and you issue that as a vendor to get paid on the HUD. And now you're listed, your company as a consultant is listed on the HUD to be paid by the proceeds out of closing. So the sponsor never touches the money because if they touch the money, you're probably not going to get it. That makes sense. And yes, you can do that. Okay. Next is the loan broker fee. If you are a mortgage broker, obviously you can get a loan broker fee. Now, I don't know if you guys know this or not. For all you real estate brokers out there that probably don't know this, there are only three states in the country, and California is not one of them, that you cannot broker a commercial loan. Did you guys know that? My, my real estate brokers, did you know that? You don't need a license to broker a commercial loan. Nor yeah. is it a conflict of interest uh, unless you're brokering the deal. Now, you can't broker the deal and loan broker the deal. You can't do that. That's illegal. Um, but you can do either or. So you are authorized in 47 states in this country. Hawaii's one. I want to say it's Idaho and I think it's Washington or the three. I can't, they're all West Coast. I, I can't remember the actual number, but California was not one of them. I was shocked about that. But you do not need a license to uh, get a fee to be a, a loan broker or refer to a loan broker where you can split their fee they get. I love referrals because I don't have to do a whole lot of work for referrals, okay? So if you know they're trying to refi this deal, don't just bring them uh, lender relationships, refer them lender relationships and have a referral fee with that lender. Again, 47 states in the country that is legal to do as a real estate broker. But a lot of real estate brokers don't know that because when we're in real estate school, they pound in your brain housing group that that is a kickback and it's illegal. They're talking about residential loans, not commercial. Took me years to figure that out. Just ask, JR. And it's going to be, on, usually it'll be on the purchase agreement. So just ask where the closing is going to be. All right, thanks. 
Okay. And of course, if you're a real estate broker, get your real estate broker fee. And if you're an insurance broker, get your insurance broker fee. So these are ways we can get paid as a strategic partner with these syndicators. But then what do you do with your fee? Depends on your goals. Always depends on your goals. Okay. Take a vacation. Yeah. That's a smart thing to do. So rejuvenate. Come back and do it again. If you're only looking for quick cash, you've got bills to pay, you've got to catch up on something, you owe the IRS, whatever the case is. Quick cash, that's intermediate, intermittent cash flow. Okay. That means you have to do it over and over again to continue to get cash flow. It's intermittent, it's one time. If you're looking for consistent cash flow or if you're looking for wealth building, okay, you may be, your goal may be cash flow because you're trying to leave a W-2. Your goal may be wealth building because you're trying to build legacy for your family. Okay, these are different ways, different goals. Back to that what. We go back to the what from lesson number one. Okay. What is that what? Is it, do you want quick cash? Do you want cash flow? Do you want to build wealth? All right. Now, once we understand that, what do we do with the money? Well, we can take it to the house. If we take it to the house and that's all we do is take it to the house and we don't do anything else with it, we go on vacation, like Steve said, we buy a car, a boat, a bigger house. We're going to pay the tax man the most. But if we reinvest up to 80% either back into the deal or as a JV into another property, now we're paying the tax man the least. Okay, But again, it depends on what your goals are. So how do you become a strategic partner? Well, go find an off-market opportunity, underwrite the deal. Now, we don't talk about underwriting in this class. There's just not enough time in one day to do that. If I wanted to make this a two-day intensive, we can spend the entire second day on underwriting, okay? Um, if you are in the strategic partnering community, obviously, you can go to the uh, strategic partnering workshop where I talk about underwriting in great detail. Build relationships with syndicators and sponsors, obviously, and then win strategic partnering assignments and collect your acquisition fee. But it doesn't stop there because you need to reinvest that based on your financial goals. So action steps to move you forward. List the problems, pains, and solutions for owners. Create your million-dollar message for the owners. Identify your roles as a strategic partner. It could be just uh, off-market opportunities or combined with due diligence, underwriting, boots on the ground, identify what they are, know your value, and then create your million-dollar message for syndicators or that value proposition like I had, okay? Okay.